You're listening to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast, where we discuss whatever the fuck we want to. And yes, we can put sex and drugs and Jesus all in the same bed and still be all right at the end of the day. My name is Devannon, and I'll be interviewing guests from every corner of this world as we dig into topics that are too risque for the morning show as we strive to help you understand what's really going on in your life. There is nothing off the table, and we've got a lot to talk about, so let's dive right into this episode. Hello, all you beautiful souls out there, and welcome back to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. Today I have with me my personal very own physician assistant, Miss Simmons, who's been treating me for the last 10 years. I wanted to have her on to talk about infectious diseases, vaccines, and different sicknesses that tend to plague our world. I've had just about every goddamn infectious disease in the book since I spent my formative years being a hoe. And so I thought I would be super transparent and talk about it. Hopefully this helps someone. Cheers to your health. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for listening to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast again. I'm so damn excited to have the lady who's responsible for me still being alive on the podcast today. Her name is Ms. Simmons. She's down there in New Orleans at the VA Healthcare Center. And this is where I go to get my medical health care done. So today we're going to be talking about health. This time of year, people tend to talk a whole lot about health because it's gay pride. And they think that gay people are responsible for all the fucking diseases. But, and you know what? If some people are only going to pay attention to sickness and disease one month out of the year, I'll take that. So we're going to work with this in this month, but really it should be all 12 months of the year. Ms. Simmons, how are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for joining us. Tell me, so, so Ms. Simmons is a person who has been doing my health care since I was homeless and I transferred all of my health and legal troubles from Houston the Baton Rouge, and she is the person who has had me under her wing for like the last 10 years. So just tell us like, so you are a physician's assistant. Tell us the difference between a doctor, a physician assistant, and a nurse practitioner. So physician assistants and nurse practitioners are what we call mid-level providers. They typically practice under the scope of guidance of a physician. Nurse practitioners are typically RNs who get additional training to function as frontline providers. They are now considered licensed, licensed, what is it? They are licensed individual practitioners. So they actually can hang out their shingle, have an office, and not work under a physician. They had to in the past. Physician assistants are mid-level providers, which means in mid-levels, basically, we can prescribe, diagnose, and treat most diseases, most of your typical diseases. But the physician assistants, I have a supervising physician. So as you become more proficient as a, a physician assistant, you typically don't have to have a doctor looking over your shoulder or watching everything you do. You, you basically practice individually, but if you run into some snags or something that's beyond your scope, you can chat with your supervising physician who may give you some guidance. So. It's, it's a little hard to explain, but a physician, four years of medical school, usually an internship, and they usually specialize into something like ear, nose, and throat, infectious disease, or some of the surgical subspecialties like dermatology, general surgery, or whatever. The physicians typically if you are a general surgeon, you're going to die a general surgeon. You're not going to switch back from working in ENT to general surgery or being a gynecologist or an infectious disease doctor because they spend 
at least eight to 10 years trying to hone in on that specialty skills. Nurse practitioners and physician assistants typically are masters prepared. They, they have a bachelor's degree in some science class. The, the nurse practitioners are typically all RNs if they get another two and a half years. Physician assistants grew out of the Army medics or the Navy medics. So your background could be anything. I was a clinical dietitian. That was my background. So when I went to PA school, I couldn't take a blood pressure. You know, I was done with a lot of the frontline things that I need to practice as a physician assistant now. But I, after two and a half years, I was able to get out on that front and practice. So that's kind of the difference. I hope I didn't cloud it. Nurse practitioners were RNs, PAs could have been anything. They could have been paramedic. They could have been nurses, but nurses typically go into the nurse practitioner field. Okay. And in, in this, in, in this neck of the woods, you're going to see probably more nurse practitioners because they have more of the schools. We are beginning to get more schools in the South now. So you may run across a few more physician assistants. Yeah. Thank you for that breakdown. I like the physician's assistants and the nurse practitioners more than the doctors. And so I always recommend, you know, alternatives to doctors, to people, because in my experience, I have found the doctors to be a little bit more like, sometimes it just don't seem like they have a soul and it's just been such a pleasure dealing with you. I don't know if it's the female thing or what, but the nurse practitioners and the physician assistants to me are nicer than the doctor. So I want people to know that if you have a doctor that's being an asshole, you don't have to deal with him. You have, or her or they, whatever the fuck, you know, you have other options out there. I didn't know about physician assistants and nurse practitioners until I met you. You know, in all these years, I was thinking I had to deal with this doctor who's going to have me waiting for three hours, even though my appointment was three hours ago. And then he only going to talk to me for five seconds and then just blaze right out the room. I didn't like that. I felt like I was disrespected by doctors. And so I don't deal with doctors anymore, you know, and then, you know, cause y'all have the same, you can prescribe medicine, you can diagnose things like there's no, you can do everything practically that a doctor can do. So there's no reason to fuck with the doctor. Right. But remember, if you have an infectious disease doctor, he has eight plus years of experience under his belt, whereas I have two and a half years. So there's a, a big difference in the knowledge base. Now, when you talk about what you need to practice and get most of the common things that people come across done, that's where, you know, we can kind of be on equal footing more so than some of the more complex things. I just want to be loved when I'm in the clinic. I don't care how much, you know, I need to feel like he cares. And so, oh, okay. I got you. From the beginning, I could tell that you cared because the doctors who may have known more than you, they just didn't have heart. So I didn't listen to them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I got you. I got you. And, and really that is the hallmark of both the mid levels. They were called position extenders to allow more times with the patients so that the doctors could see the more difficult patients and we could see the more typical or our frontline patients. So it works. Okay. Then you mentioned infectious disease. Now you specialize in infectious diseases. What made you want to go into that? And why are you passionate about infectious diseases? Well, to be honest, when I finished PA school, the VA help fund my, my education to go to PA school, because as I mentioned, I was a clinical dietitian and I had a passion or want to do a little more for patients other than their nutritional needs. And I was looking for a career that I could build on what I already had on the board. So after I finished PA school, I was stationed here at the VA in New Orleans, and this is 
2003 to 2005, I was in general primary care, general primary care, which is always something good to start in and then to move into a, you know, a specialty, a subspecialty. So Katrina came, I moved to Texas, Houston, Michael E. DeBakey, I'm sure you're familiar with, with them. I was there from 2005 to 2011. So in order for me to transfer back to New Orleans, the infectious disease was open, so I applied for it. So it wasn't like I was, I was specifically seeking it out. It was what was open, but I can tell you that it's been very rewarding and I'm so glad I'm in it and compared to some of these other things. I'm, I'm just excited about it. I love my job. Okay. I love that you love your job. I can tell. So we're going to talk about me and we're okay. going to talk about my, my, my sexual history, my disease history, because since I've had them near every disease in the book, it's a great way to educate people about diseases. So I have my list of diseases that I have had. So I'm going to mm -hmm. go down them one by one, and then we're going to talk about them in kind of like just what it is, the treatments for it, you know, and of course, what happens if you don't treat it. So, so let's start with HIV. Okay. So what, how is it, um, how is it treated? Oh, okay. Basically, it's, it's treated with antiretroviral medications. Most individuals today can be treated with one pill a day. And the pill generally consists of two or more drugs that will help suppress the virus, stop it from multiplying, and it will also eradicate all the virus that's in your blood. What? It does not, it does not, however, do anything about the virus that's inside your tissues, like the lining of your heart, your gut, all of those. It's, it's dormant. It's still there. And if you get off the medicine, of course, it will multiply and, you know, populate your, your body as well as your blood. So explain to us what. HIV is and, and then what AIDS is, what does HIV okay. do your body? So if you think about a box, I'm going to just use a box, a box that contains your immune system or your T cells or your CD4 count, your CD4 number, a normal T cell or CD4 count is somewhere between four and, and 1500. So this is what we use to fight infection, viruses, bacterial infections, any little thing that we can come in contact. If we have an intact immune system, we can fight most diseases. Sometimes we can succumb to the disease, but you know, once your, your system is strong enough, it can fight it off and eventually it will clear usually with the help of antibiotics or antivirals or whatever we need to treat it. In a person who's been infected with the HIV virus, what it does is that little box of fighters or your T cells, it kills them. So people who had maybe a thousand, you know, when they first become infected, you know, they can go down very low. Any T cell count below 200 is considered A. And after you get into that range, you pretty much will have problems fighting normal infections that come your way, but also those that are considered opportunistic. So. These are little things that are in the atmosphere, but they don't really infect those individuals with intact immune systems. So things like MAC, 
Tuberculosis is also one that is considered opportunistic, thrush. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of your STDs or STI, you can become infected with those, but it tends to be a little worse in, not a little worse, a lot worse in somebody who doesn't have a good immune system. So it's basic what, what HIV does, it attacks your immune system. It kills your T cells over time, not all at once, but over time, the longer you go without treatment, the more T cells will be destroyed and probably never will, you won't get them back either. The other thing that happens as the, the virus invades your body, it multiplies. And so your viral load or how much virus is detectable in your blood can go from undetectable if you're on medicines to in the thousands or the millions. The problem with having that in your blood is that it increases the inflammation in your body, putting you at higher risk for everything, heart attacks, strokes, cancers, all of those things. That's why it's very important to get treated as soon as possible after the infection and to stay undetectable and suppressed. Okay. And then how is HIV transfer? Like how can someone catch it? It's through blood and genital fluids. Okay. So sex, sharing needles, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then I want to talk about hepatitis. Hepatitis, I think there's like hepatitis A, B, C, and B. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several different ones. I have hepatitis B. How can people catch hepatitis? Same way. Okay. So still blood and needles and what? what and and part, genital fluids. And gen genital fluids. And what part of the body does hepatitis attack or go for? How does the it? The liver. So HEPA is Greek for liver itis is inflammation of. So it's the liver, but any of these diseases, like the target organ for hepatitis is liver, but if it goes untreated, it, the other organs become impacted sooner or later. So, you know, and hep B is one of those that just have it, you have an increased risk for liver cancer, mm -hmm. which is why you have to have your liver check every six months. We do the screening on your liver as well as we make sure you there's no hep B virus on board because any virus on board that's not supposed to be there is going to cause a problem. Eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And probably more sooner than later. So y'all, what she's saying is, so they send me to get like my liver scanned a couple of times a year, just to get like a more visual look at what's going on because, because Ms. Emerson is super thorough like that. And this is the central reason why I wanted to have her on the show to talk about, you know, healthcare from a more thorough perspective. Because when I'm talking to the homies out there in the community, they're not having like these kind of tests done. Their doctors are not checking for these things. And so I wanted to throw it out there to hopefully help somebody. So the next thing I want to talk about is syphilis. Now you scared the shit out of me with this one here, because when I was running around being a little hoe, I was getting syphilis like every other damn day. And she, you, you said the words to me, you were, you were like, you ever heard the term blind, cripple and crazy. <laughs> and then I thought when I was in jail the last time, there was a guy who had contracted syphilis. And so then he was in a fucking wheelchair with a cane and he had had a stroke. So the, the problem I have with healthcare is me not being straight and I'm considered to be high risk when I was going to doctors who didn't cater to a lot of non-straight people. They knew that I had highly promiscuous ways and they were not checking me for these things, you know, whereas you did. So, and somebody else's doctor, you know, maybe skipping them too. So tell us how serious syphilis is. It's easy to treat. I know you just get penicillin mm -hmm. shot in the ass and it just like takes care of it. It's super easy to treat, but right. if, but it, you, and you get syphilis through sex and like needles and stuff too. And I guess vaginal, I mean, genital fluids as well. 
But what is syphilis? What does it attack? And what happens if you don't treat it? Beat, spread. It's, it's kind of skin to skin. So say you have oral sex with somebody who has open lesions in their mouth. They can spread it like that. So you, it's, it's a sneaky little devil in that it can present so many different ways it can present as a rash and and some of the rashes if you if you look up the 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 syphilis rash it, it doesn't have to it can present differently they call syphilis the great imitator you think you're looking at something and it's syphilis so in anybody with hiv I routinely test them for syphilis. That's just part of their regular labs because whether they said it's sexually active or not, whatever, some of them forget, you know, I don't, I don't really know. But if the syphilis moves from your blood into your nervous system, you can develop what is called neurosyphilis. And People with neurosyphilis, it can impact your cognition. It can also impact, impact your nervous system. So, you know, your nerves innovate your ability to walk and move. And all of these things can be impacted with untreated syphilis. And we use the term blind, crippleless, crippled, and crazy because it can cause blindness. Anything in your nervous system and your your nervous system includes your brain and your ability to move around. So all of those things can be impacted with untreated syphilis. And those individuals with HIV, especially AIDS, especially untreated HIV, the the progression of Syphilis to neural syphilis is much more rapid and fast. Whereas, say, a non-infected person with syphilis, they may they may carry syphilis for years without any symptoms. That's a horrible thing because eventually they will have symptoms and you can't really reverse a lot of that. So it's best to stay checked and get your treatment whenever you need it. Okay, so we'll do an easy one. Gonorrhea and chlamydia, lots of people have had this. I does, so does this, and this is sexually transmitted, those are just sexually transmitted diseases that present as like a, some sort of color discharge. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's the same in males and females in terms of discharge, but. Yeah, the males typically with chlamydia, they, they, they are typ typically asymptomatic. Females with chlamydia, they get this kind of little funny older, funny discharge. On a real, usually you got a burn, a burn. You know, they, it'll present with that, and it may have a discharge. So males typically, I think, when it comes to STDs that matter, other than syphilis, because syphilis can be tricky sometimes, they typically know when something is, is, is different. Females, on the other hand, some of these things can be silent and they can wreak havoc, havoc on the females. You know, it can destroy all of your reproductive organs. So it is, it's, it's, you gotta get, you gotta get checked. You gotta stay checked. If you are sexually active, you, you open yourself up to a large plethora of diseases and infections. So. I think you would ask what was the difference between the STI and the STD. So the infection is just what it is. It is some type of bacteria, parasite, virus, or whatever that enters your body and causes an infection. When it starts to impact your organs and other parts of your body, it's considered a disease. So some of these diseases we can treat very easily, like gonorrhea and syphilis and, you know, uh, chlamydia, we can treat them. They're bacterial infections for the most part. The viral ones, you know, viruses, 
the thorn to tree viruses. We know, we know, we know that. So we have developed the medicines to keep the virus suppressed so that it can do a minimal amount of harm as long as you get it on board early and you stay compliant. So is there, are there any risks to males with chlamydia and gonorrhea if it goes untreated? Can it mess with our kidneys or organs or reproductive systems or anything like that? The chlamydia, not so much. Maria, what I'll say about that is that I have very few people that go, men especially, that go undiagnosed with gonorrhea because they are usually symptomatic. So I'm I'm not really sure of, of what happens long-term, long-treated gonorrhea. I'd have to check in on that. But I typically... The, Anybody comes in and something is going on with their urine or whatever, but I'll check for all of these things. So I, I usually don't have the long term. The, the syphilis, you can have some people that go a long time because it's silent. And some of your subsequent syphilis infections really have no symptoms at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So then I wanted to talk about Awards. So I've had any awards before back in like 2002, 2003. From what I understand, this has to do with like the HPV virus mm -hmm. family. Sometimes like, it's like everyone's exposed to it. When you start having sex, sometimes warts will show up on some people. Sometimes mm -hmm. it won't on others, even though they were exposed to the same thing. So right. I have very sensitive skin and that's why I think maybe they showed up on me. I don't know. That's not a medical thing I was ever told anywhere, but it's the only sense, you know, that I can make out of it. So explain to us what warts are, where on the body they can appear and what causes them. The virus is HPV and it's past skin to skin. Most people who are sexually active have had it at some point in their life. And we, we all know that if I have sex with you, I'm having sex with you and everybody else you don't have sex with. So I'm getting all of that. So females, we've always gotten pap smears and that's what they do with a pap smear. You know, they, they check the skin in the cervical area and they run tests for HPV. They remove any lesions that it can cause. Males, and especially male, males who have, re have receptive anal sex, same thing applied. The HPV virus is a certain strains can cause anal cancer. So that's, that's your worst case scenario, anal cancer. Anal genital genital warts that is from that same virus so the virus is causing these diseases the warts the cancer or whatever that's that's how a lot of people have hpv they hang have it and over time it just clears on its own because it's the virus is not like a pill or anything you could take for that the only thing you can do is get a vaccine and the vaccine actually works the best when you get it when you're very young, like in your teens, be, well, might need to start nine and 10 before you become sexually active. And we all know the promise of a vaccine is, first of all, to prevent you from getting the disease. But if you get the disease, to mitigate the impact of the disease. So... Right. So like when I had anal warts, like she's saying, they can't treat it. They just like numbed my ass area. And they burn they burn a, yeah, they burn them off. Just but, like they do with females. When, when we have uh, lesions or even abnormal cells, you know, because he can tell you he had an anoscopy where they look with the lighted scope to get a really good look at the skin there to see if there are any lesions to remove or if there's anything going on with the skin that they, they need to treat or do, do something with. So it's, right. uh, 
And so uh, Ms. Simmons had referred me to what general surgery for what she just said was an anoscopy. So what this means is since I had anal warts before, they can come back. So you have to keep a watch on the area to be sure what she is saying is an abnormal cell. So what I got was like an anal pap, which is something that I think guys and girls can get. If you like to get poked in the booty, be you male, female, or whatever, you know, then you, you need to get an anal pap. And they take a, like a cotton swab and roll it around. And then they send that off to some lab, some damn where to, to, to see if they find any abnormal cells. If they don't find abnormal cells, great. Keep on fucking. If they do, well, then they, then they got to take a deeper look, in which case I went under anesthesia. And then they went in there and they actually found precancerous cells the first time, which they cut out and removed. And so now I have to go each year t- to get what I'm coining my anal rejuvenation procedure every year. So they got to put me under, <laughs> put me under anesthesia every year and go in there and be sure that I don't have any cancer or shit going on. Right. And so another thing that I think that is not spoken a lot about. So you mentioned vaccines that she, she was talking about the HPV vaccine, which I just got like last year. I had never heard of it. It takes almost a year to get the vaccine because it's done in three series. So ask your doctors about all these vaccines and different ways to help fight these diseases that we're talking about. There was one vaccine I got from you called meningococcal. Mm-hmm. What is that for? So that's to prevent meningitis. It is recommended for any individual. There, there are several vaccines the meningococcal there's a new formulation i think some people who may have been in the military may have received it you see that meningococcal b advertisement on tv and that's usually people that are in close quarters like people in dorms people soldiers in barracks you know anybody homeless people, people living in shelters, those those people are at high risk to develop that. The CD has determined that anyone living with HIV needs to be vaccinated against this uh, disease because in a person with HIV, even if it's well controlled, it could have serious repercussions. So meningitis is an infection of the meninges. So that's in your brain and, and spinal cord. So just to know the having that, that's not a good thing to have. You can die from that. And so that is important to get those, that vaccine. They also recommended that anyone living with HIV get the shingles vaccine. It, it initially was 50 plus. But now it's for anybody with HIV and everybody else that's 50 plus and probably some other people that have any other diseases that may suppress their immune system or compromise their immune system. The Gardasil or the HPV, those individuals 45 and less. You know, after that, I guess they figured it's not going to do much. At this point, anyway, it used to be less than 26, I think, and they increased it to 45. You could get it up to 45. That's a three-shot series. Also, your Prevnar, if you've been living with HIV for any any length of time, you should have received the Prevnar 13. There are some new Prev, I think it's 20, and there's one 15 that we would give to like if I got any new HIV people, we don't use the 13 anymore. We use one of the, the, the 20. The the Pneumovax 23 is the regular pneumonia vaccine that we also give all of our individuals living with HIV. So you get two pneumonia vaccines, the Prevnar initially, and then eight weeks later, we get that. So... Tdap, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, and you get that. Everybody knows about a tetanus shot and diphtheria, but and pertussis—that's the whooping cough. 
So the CDC has determined that anybody with HIV, we first of all, we don't want you getting none of this, but if you get it, we want to make sure that it's medicated. You don't get sick, too sick from it, and you don't die from it. So that's the promise of vaccines. And, you know, I guess my patients get sick of me. I, I feel like I'm a vaccine queen because I'm always pushing these vaccines. And I know a lot of people have a lot of reservations about vaccines in general, but I really try over time to convince them. I don't, can't force anybody to do anything, but I try to make a case as to why you want to, to have them. And you need to stay up on your vaccines. The only way you can stay up on vaccines is to be on the, the guidance of doctor, PA and P, whoever you want to be on the, but they need to, if you go on a regular basis, you will get everything you need or will at least be offered. If you want any more information about any vaccines, any of the STIs, the, any of those things, you can go to the CDC site and you can just put it in. Because Mr. Hubert called me about monkeypox. I, I had to go because right now it's kind of new on this scene. It, it is spreading in this country, but it's not, it's a concern, but it's not you know, like COVID or whatever, it, it's not getting that attention, but you keep yourself up to date, going to a site that has good knowledge and something that's understandable for anybody to read and understand. Okay. Then one of the last two questions that I have, do you think any of these diseases we've talked about today are more common in the straight world or in the LGBTQIA world, or do you see it across the board? Well. I I will say that my my patient population is mostly men. I have a few women, and really haven't been treated the women for anything because a lot of the the females once they get HIV they all of a sudden they're not even sexually active anymore. So the the disease that I see the most. It's syphilis. And then when I looked it up, it is probably the most common in these parts. So that, I think the question was, what, what do I see? Like and, and versus, thing or... and the, the issue with, with straight people or even bisexual people or whatever, a lot of those people are, you know, they don't even talk about their sexual habits or practices with their providers. And a lot of the providers don't even ask because it's uncomfortable. You, you know, you just, they just don't do it. I mean, I think about myself as a primary care provider then and now being in infectious disease. It's just like part of the conversation for me now. But as a regular primary care provider, don't ask. <laughs> they don't tell me that, you know, that's, it just never comes up. So it's kind of hard to know if they're actually being treated or diagnosed at the same rate than what we call a high risk population where we check in every five minutes for everything. We're going to definitely catch more in, in my population than the, the people that's on the sixth floor or regular primary care. Okay. So then what she's saying y'all is that since I'm a man who has sex with men, the, the mindset in the medical field is to check us because we have such a bad reputation and stigma attached to us. But what she's saying is the straight people could be doing worse than us, but it, they, it's not really tracked as hard. So she really can't give you a definitive answer because there's not enough data on what the straight people, cause they trying to keep they shit on the down low. <laughs> <laughs> Right. True. And it's not even a, it's not even a part of the conversation. Really. I think when I go to my doctor, they know where to, you know, and I, I know I'm older now. So, but even when I was younger, no, you know, 
you know, or do you, you, you itch and you got an infection, they, they'll check you for that. But HIV, uh, I was never checked for that. I had to ask to be checked for those things. So I, I, I just think that it's gone by the day where the doctor is gone and he's just barking out all these orders to you. You are a big part. You are the most important part of your health care. And you have a right to find out if you don't understand something or something just doesn't make, is, you understand it, but it doesn't make sense to you to question. And there are a lot of good resources out there that you can look to, read up about, and, you know, have an intelligent conversation with your, your healthcare provider or even, and no question is, too simple, too silly to ask. If if it's something bothering you, you need to talk about it because that's what they paying us for. So right, and so <laughs> then I, I just want to remind everybody: to be sure you get all your vitamin levels checked. Miss Simmons is the first doctor. Every time I go in there, twice a year, they're checking all these, you know, cholesterol, vitamin this, vitamin D, and everything. And I know a lot of people, especially here in the South, it's like the doctors only check for like HIV, but they missed like the whole panel. Vitamins are important too, to be sure that these diseases are not pulling down your vitamin absorption. And, and I just want to remind people when you have earwax, as I had, she, you mentioned ENT earlier, that's ear, nose, and throat. I had this bad ear ache before and we thought it was like this whole thing. And then Ms. Simmons had enough sense to send me to the ear, nose and throat doctor. And the dude reached into my ear with these tweezers and pulled out like a two inch back log jam of earwax. Cause I had did like I learned in the South to clean my ears with Q-tips and what you really need is a peroxide solution. And so I just wanted to mention that and throw that out there because somebody who's really close to me, who's like in their mid twenties was still cleaning their ears with tooth with Q-tips. <laughs> so just let you know that, let throw the Q-tips yeah, away. Yeah, because typically you're just pushing it further back in. Yeah. You know, if, if you have some ear, some wax in the, in the external canal, you know, as long as you're not sticking it all the way in, but most of the time you can't really see what you're doing, actually pushing it in. So you can... Debrox is over the counter. You you put it the solution and give you the little ear syringe and you do it. And of course, there are some people who have just really tiny canals and they, they you know they accumulate a lot of wax. You may need to go to someone to get it cleaned out. Mm-hmm. All it's right. the whole world. <laughs> the whole new world. And th- those are all the questions I have for you. I thank you so much for your time today. And, and so any last words you have, you can say anything to the world you want to say. I'll let you have the last word. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. I really, really, really love all of my patients. I've been doing this for about 11 years. So everybody's like an extended family. Some of the, I know you asked me about some of the, some sad things. Of course, as some of my patients have aged, I've I've lost some of them, and that is hard to deal with. But the good thing is, is that with HIV, your life expectancy is about the same as your non-HIV counterpart. But because you do have HIV, your surveillance has to be much more than your non-HIV counterpart because you are at high risk for most of the things that kill everybody else, cancers, and not just the anal cancers. I'm talking about, you know, lung cancer, uh, some of the skin cancers, just a lot of, of things that would kill your mama and your grandpa and everybody else. But in you, with this virus, even though it's suppressing your blood, is still in you, you really need to be checked. And that's the importance of finding a provider that you're comfortable with 
that you can go to. You can call them if you have a question about something that they listen to you and take care of. So that's really all I have to say. And, and thank you. Oh, thank you. And just amen and amen. Thank you all so much for taking time to listen to the Sex, Drugs, and Jesus podcast. It really means everything to me. Look, if you love the show, you can find more information and resources at sexdrugsandjesus.com or wherever you listen to your podcast. Feel free to reach out to me directly at Devannon at sexdrugsandjesus.com and on Twitter and Facebook as well. My name is Devannon. It's been wonderful being your host today. And just remember that everything is going to be all right.